Good morning and welcome to COVID-19 and its impact on commercial real estate. I'm Richard Crouch. I'm a partner at Van Devender Black and I'm joined by my partners Chris Ambrosio and Jay Rixey, who are also commercial real estate practitioners in the Van Devender Black office. And we're also joined by our colleague in the Richmond office of Van Devender Black, Jed Donaldson, who practices uh, bankruptcy law. So today we'll be talking about a lot of the issues uh, that we've been receiving from our clients who happen to be landlords, borrowers, tenants, just about anybody who's impacted in the commercial real estate world in this current environment. Next slide, please. So there'll be two main areas that we're talking about today. And as we if you have certain questions, given the format of this webinar, the best way to submit those questions will be using the question icon, which you'll actually see as a little word cloud with a question mark on it. And if you click on that and submit your questions, we will compile those and try to answer those prior to conclusion of the presentation. But most likely, most of those questions will be answered towards the end of the presentation. and We'll answer those that we can in that time frame. So next slide, please. So the areas that we'll be talking about today are uh, pressing basic commercial issues. These can go from leases to loan documents to a lot of the other inquiries that we're getting right now. And my partner, Chris Ambrosio, will be talking about some of the financial assistance that's available to small businesses. And as many of you are probably aware, there's been some very recent developments with respect to the PPP program. And I'll let Chris allude to that right now and in terms of how that will shape uh, his summary for purposes of today. Chris. Thank you, Richard. And uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I see that we have a, a number of clients and friends uh, joining us and we thank you for your time. Uh, and we're glad that uh, you could participate. Um, also, a, before I forget, a quick thank you to our production staff uh, at Van Deventer Black. Uh, we have Jennifer Serrano, who's our marketing communications director, and Bryce Bourdon, who's our IT director. Uh, they are uh, helping us put this on uh, because, of course, Richard and Jay and I don't have nearly the technical expertise to do it. Um, and also our uh, marketing director, Kristen Fletcher, who is not on the call, but she has uh, helped us uh, quite a bit in putting this together. And in, in general, these folks have been working very hard to get our e-blasts out, and we've been putting on other webinars uh, to try to keep our clients and, and friends updated uh, during this very difficult time. Uh, as Richard mentioned, my part of the presentation is to talk about the uh, financial assistance available to small businesses. Um, literally, when we were doing the, the dry run test of this presentation yesterday, we got the word that the government ran out of money, uh, uh, that $350 billion went uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so uh, that could um, <laughs> obviously uh, uh, make the, the second part of this presentation less relevant. However, uh, it looks like uh, the folks in Congress are struggling to find some additional money in the uh, Treasury's couch cushions, uh, another $250 billion, uh, to be precise. Uh, they, uh, the Democrats and Republicans are currently uh, have not agreed on whether to add another $250 billion on top of that for other things. Um, and unfortunately, because Congress doesn't reconvene fully until May 4th, if they are going to provide additional funding for these, these small business loan programs, they will have to do it by unanimous consent. That means if a single senator or a single representative objects, it will not pass until they can get the whole group together for a regular vote. Um, but notwithstanding that, like I said, I, I will run through the basics of these programs because you know, our, our best guess is that they will come back, but we won't spend as much time on it as we had planned. 
Um, so thank you, Richard. OK, well, I'll resume the discussion uh, in terms of leases. I would say probably in a, on the current slide that we're looking at, these are probably most of the inquiries that we're getting, whether from landlords or tenants in terms of how this is going to be addressed. And one of the questions we've gotten is, will the government inject any sort of relief to help tenants out in terms of being able to excuse or delay their obligations to pay rent? Uh, overall, and I'd say this is also generally true in the context of loan documents as well, but the, the government is generally very reluctant to interfere with private contracts. So you'll find like any other contract, that's what a lease is. And if, if a tenant has an obligation to pay rent and any cure period or grace period has expired, uh, the landlord generally can terminate the lease. Now, of course, there are certain other provisions to which a tenant can avail themselves, which we'll discuss in more detail. But generally, there's not going to be much government intervention to, to speak of that's going to basically be able to excuse tenant's performance in that regard. Uh, even a bankruptcy filing, uh, if a landlord has terminated a lease, a uh, bankruptcy filing won't necessarily save that lease. Uh, however, and there is a nuance here, and um, Jed may allude to this later if you all have uh, specific questions, if there's a bankruptcy filing that occurs before the lease is terminated, that's somewhat of a game changer. And that does hamstring the rights and remedies of the parties until the bankruptcy decides what's going to happen with certain assets. So if there is a bankruptcy filing before the lease is actually terminated, uh, the tenant is most likely going to be given the opportunity to assume or reject that lease. And that will basically be able to preclude some of the uh, landlord's remedies or certainly slow them down um, in the context of bankruptcy. So again, if you have questions regarding the impact of bankruptcy um, in this current environment, feel free to submit them those and we will take a look at those uh, towards the conclusion of the presentation uh, and you can advance to the next slide please so many of the questions actually uh yes uh, many of the questions that we've gotten uh related to leases have to do with lease workouts uh before i discuss too much about uh, other provisions of the lease and how they can be construed um, uh, generally, I'd say that the, uh, the general mindset we've seen amongst parties has been generally a cooperative spirit. And I think you'll find that most leases are generally drafted in such a way that they are favorable uh, to the landlord in terms of rights and remedies. But fortunately, it seems like a lot of landlords have come to the conclusion that simply being legally right or having the higher legal ground is not necessarily the most optimal solution. It seems that landlords are understanding that being responsive and flexible and collaborating is really the best strategy right now. Because uh, there may be scenarios where landlords are disinclined to utilize their remedies or courts are unavailable or unwilling to grant relief. Uh, it's no surprise to many of you that there have been a suspension of non-essential uh, proceedings and frankly a shortage of personnel right now to handle a lot of these filings. So the reality is it's a situation where it will take a long time to get a judgment and uh, getting a judgment may be a hollow victory because recovering on those judgments may be virtually impossible. So landlords do seem to have the mindset that cooperation is a better strategy rather than digging through lease provisions and making arguments regarding everyone's respective uh, responsibility. So some of the recommendations that we would suggest um, during lease workouts, particularly to tenants, uh, the first is to communicate early and often with your landlord. Know exactly what your notice provisions require, particularly if you're thinking of either terminating your lease or contracting your space that you're leasing. Um, and one thing that's been interesting to hear from a lot of our landlord clients is um, even though they're being cooperative and they have a pretty refined process for request, requesting rent reduction, there are many tenants who are asking for rent relief but are not providing the supporting information that's needed. So it's typical for most of our landlord clients that they actually have a formal application uh, 
that doesn't require a whole lot of information, but maybe three or four questions for tenants to explain how COVID-19 has impacted them and how they're adjusting their business operations to cope with it and what their business plan is, uh, as well as providing financial information from the past several years, um, disclosing what sort of government assistance they've applied for, um, as well as other assistance. For example, it might be a franchisee and maybe the franchisor has made some concessions or offers to help out. But surprisingly, um, many of those tenants aren't even bothering to fill out the entire uh, application and are simply doing a blind ask. So that's one of our suggestions, particularly for people who are uh, speaking to tenants, is to make sure that you are cooperative with your landlord. Try to also appreciate your landlord's situation because we're all in this together. Landlords are accountable to others as well, not just investors, uh, but they have lenders that they have to placate. And so that's another thing for tenants to be mindful of is realizing that as you're engaging in these discussions for modifications of leases and reduction of rent, that lenders are most likely going to have to approve these modifications as well. So keeping that in mind, or at least having some contingency stating that the lender is going to have to approve any modification is wise as well. But uh, in general, having a realistic, well-formed strategy with information that supports the need for the rent relief is the wisest approach and is probably going to render the best results in actually getting relief rather than having a blind ask. Um, being transparent is the key and uh, is more likely to, to result in an acceptable solution between the parties. Um, one other thing that tenants are going to have to consider is at what uh, point, How what's going to be the degree of what they need to do? Are they simply going to be requesting a rent reduction or are they going to be looking to exit the building as well? So that's one other thing that will need to be uh, to be determined. So one other thing um, tenants should probably expect is that there are going to be some trade-offs or concessions in connection with requesting reductions in rent. So tenants should not be surprised if the landlord wants them to extend their lease or to waive certain tenant friendly provisions such as rights of first refusal or rights to expand. Um, we also suggest that tenants review their insurance policies to see what insurance coverage may apply. We do know some people have been running into struggles with business interruption insurance if they even have it because that tends to contemplate losses due to physical damage and not so much contagion, or there may be exceptions for epidemics. So that's definitely worth talking to their insurance consultants and advisors about that. But I would say uh, one advice in lease workout situations for, uh, I'd say for both parties, um, is to carefully document everything that's happened because it will become relevant in your later discussions regarding modifications as well as insurance claims and so on. But if there has been a virus contracted in one of the buildings and our, our landlords clients have been great about this is meticulously document the date it was discovered, when notices were given, when closures occurred, as well as any remedial actions that followed. So that's our general recommendations for lease workouts. Now I'm going to talk more about some of the other provisions. If the lease workouts stall out for whatever reason, some of the other provisions that may be helpful to tenants. Now, force majeure is a phrase that's on the tip of everyone's tongue these days. Um, a lot of tenants are hopeful that that's going to be broad enough to excuse or delay obligations on, under the lease, particularly the obligation to pay. Uh, unfortunately, and a lot of our overview is going to be from the perspective of Virginia law, but unfortunately, uh, force majeure clauses tend to be very dependent on the facts and circumstances of the situation and the language that appears in the lease. Uh, please move to the next slide. So unfortunately for a lot of tenants, the language of force majeure clauses tends to be very narrowly construed in scope. Uh, courts are very reluctant to make too much of a leap or to infer too much uh, into what constitutes an excusable or a force majeure event. Uh, 
if it doesn't appear in the express language of the clause. So a lot of people will have the question, well, what about circumstances beyond the control of the party? Surely that's a catch all that would address the situation or acts of God. Surely that's something that would fall under that. But I think you will find that it's it's a high bar to uh, to invoke and um, courts are not necessarily going to infer that that's included in that language. So in Virginia, the general standard they look at is whether the language in the clause addresses the event in question, whether the event actually prevents fulfillment of the obligation, and whether that obligation is sought to be excused by the language. Now, one critical thing to keep in mind that a lot of people don't realize, but you will find in probably most leases, even if there is a force majeure event that excuses or delays performance, oftentimes there's a sentence that specifically excludes monetary or payment obligations. And this would not only be base rent, but obligations to maintain insurance and fund allowances and any other sums under the lease. Those would still stay in place if that language is in there, basically saying that payment is excluded from force majeure events. Uh, please move to the next slide. So generally, courts are going to look for the language and actually, uh, I believe uh, Chris Ambrosio is going to interject. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Richard. Um, I was just going to mention on force majeure clauses. I know we are talking about leases, but we've gotten uh, a number of questions on purchase and sale agreements for land or investment real estate. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of folks have noticed that there is not necessarily a force majeure clause in the purchase and sale agreement. Um, the reason is the lifetime of a purchase and sale agreement is typically only a few months. Uh, and there's not uh, typically continuing obligations that a party would seek to be excused from. The specific force majeure type events that would come up such as a fire or a uh, hurricane or damage to the property, those are covered by a specific casualty provision um, and then usually in parallel with a condemnation provision if the uh, subject property um, is damaged in that way. Uh, but because the, the purchase and sale agreement generally wraps up within a few months, uh, you don't have a force majeure clause, unlike a lease where it goes on for years and years. Uh, so that has uh, caused some some uh, frustration with uh, some uh, parties who are trying to um, move forward on a uh, on a closing. Uh, and as as uh, is, is so typical during this time, it is forcing people to uh, come together to negotiate and frankly to uh, uh, ignore certain parts of the contract because it's not in either party's benefit to try to enforce it. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank right. you. Thank you, Chris. So in general, courts are going to be looking for language in the force majeure clause saying it was is pandemic, epidemic, contagion, or any of those reference in there. And um, if they're not, they're not as likely to uh, assume that that's what should be included. Uh, in that clause. Uh, it's, it's somewhat of an unfortunate answer uh, for a lot of folks that are looking for relief in that regard. However, there are also some alternative theories and language that parties are seemingly successfully being able to use um, in this context. So some people are relying on language saying performance has been uh, preempted or precluded by governmental restrictions or emergency government action has pre precluded our ability to perform. Um, some other lease provisions that tenants are utilizing, whether individually or collectively to try to uh, excuse or delay performance, is the doctrine of frustration of purpose or impossibility of performance, saying that the key reason this lease was entered into can no longer be accomplished due to the current circumstances. Now, I think one complication that you run into that is if there are multiple purposes of the lease, and maybe one of them can't be fulfilled, but others can be fulfilled, then that may be enough for the lease to stay in place. And one prime example I think of is restaurants. We all know that they are taking a beating right now, but many of them are still able to do takeout 
even though they don't have in-house dining. So in some regards, some of the purposes can still be fulfilled, even though it's not their traditional means of incurring the revenue. Um, so that would be one example of, of why maybe that particular lease would not automatically be terminated as a result. Uh, some of the other provisions that tenants are looking to, this is more of an issue in the retail arena, but are co-tenancy clauses. So oftentimes there's the right to either reduce rent or terminate the lease altogether if another tenant in the center uh, happens to vacate. Uh, so there may be some success in invoking those provisions. Um, also interruption of service, denial of access as they pertain to landlord obligations uh, or other grounds that tenants are trying to assert in addition to the force majeure clause. Um, one struggle with this, however, is usually the uh, failure to perform in those regards usually has to be due to some fault of the landlord. Um, and usually probably the lease is going to uh, contemplate that as well. Uh, and then some tenants are even going as far as to invoke uh, both casualty and condemnation uh, provisions to try to excuse or delay performance. Now, some of the issues with this may be obvious. Casualty, I think most, most folks in leases would contemplate that that contemplates more physical damage such as fire or other uh, destructive means and not so much for contagion. Uh, but there may, may be some more success in condemnation, although that usually contemplates some transfer of title associated with that process. Uh, depending on the language of the lease, um, if temporary takings are contemplated under the condemnation section due to some of these forced closures, there could be some success in making those those arguments as well. But I would say overall, our general recommendation is that tenants not assume any of these obligations, or excuse me, any of these provisions are going to excuse their obligations to pay rent. Uh, and then if they're able, they should continue to try to pay rent and raise these issues later and possibly request a, a refund down the road. So before I move to the next slide, I just wanted to give Jay Rixey a opportunity to chime in with any other thoughts he had on uh, force majeure or other provisions of the lease. Yeah, yeah thank you, Richard. Um, there's some very good points there. I would like to follow up on one or two points about force majeure because we really have been getting a lot of questions about it. Um, first of all, I think it's important to reiterate that the mere presence of a force majeure clause in a contract or a lease is not an automatic get out of jail free card, for lack of a better term, with respect to your contractual obligations. For example, we've had many tenant clients contact us in the past few weeks stating that they brought out their old lease, looked at it and saw that paragraph 28 was a force majeure clause regardless of what it says and they conclude that automatically that means they don't have to pay rent unfortunately it's not really as simple as that in reality typically force majeure clauses apply more to the delivery of goods and services and not the payment of monetary obligations for example if i contract to deliver you a certain amount of goods by a certain date and now due to the current circumstances, I can't deliver those goods to you because the factories that make those goods are all shut down and therefore there aren't any goods available to deliver. In that situation, the force majeure clause may excuse performance. However, in the lease context, force majeure typically does not apply to the payment of rent. As Richard stated, many force majeure clauses in commercial leases specifically exclude payment of rent. And it sort of makes sense because in reality, other than a tenant possibly not having the money because they've had to shut down their business temporarily, is the tenant really prevented from writing a rent check as opposed to are they prevented from delivering services or providing goods? At this time, and Richard touched on this as well, we really are in unprecedented times. And the best advice, as Richard stated, is is to advise tenants and landlords to work together to find a mutually acceptable solution that will work toward, for all parties. For example, something that I've seen happen several times over the past two weeks or so is that we've had some landlord clients who have agreed to allow tenants a two or three month waiver on rent 
but then they will require the tenant to sign a two or three months extension on the back end. That is just one example of how um, tenants and landlords are working together. Uh, um, but that, that's about it. So I think I'll pass it back to you now, Richard. Uh, yes, I, I would certainly agree with the last comment that Jay made. That's been probably the most common mechanism I've seen in the lease context is basically deferring payments. 90 to 120 days seems like the most popular time frame uh, with some understanding that the payment will be caught up within approximately less than a year. Um, you know, one other thing that I think uh, tenants are able to do to make it a bit more palatable for landlords to grant that as a concession in terms of deferral is maybe they continue to pay operating expenses um, during that time frame. So that, for the most part, in the lease context is, is how we're seeing people handle it um, for the time being. So uh, that's most of, of what we had to say on leases. And so I'll move to the next slide. And you can move to the next slide as well. And now we come to loan documents. Now, a lot of the same principles apply in theory. Uh, we've gotten the question from a number of folks is, will there be any government induced relief to enable me to avoid paying my mortgage payments and debt payments? And the answer is largely the same as what you'd see in the lease context. Uh, government is generally reluctant to interfere with private contracts. Now, generally speaking, uh, we have been seeing a cooperative spirit in this arena as well. Um, I'd say there are some exceptions to that. Um, I'd say if you perhaps have a lender who with their various loan portfolios has, is more weighted in say hospitality right now and they're struggling more, they may be less likely to uh, be cooperative uh, with their borrowers. But again, <clears throat> I would say the most common solution that we've been seeing is a deferral of payment again from 90 to 120 days uh, with the understanding that will be paid off um, within the following year. Uh, that's generally what we've been seeing. Um, this can take the form of uh, extensions to maturity dates for approximately that time frame. Um, we've had a number of deals where there are ongoing refinances that were in process when the uh, current crisis hit and so they've been trying to determine how to properly uh, extend and document uh, in that regard but for the most part it, banks are, seem to be working with regulators for other relief packages and government agencies seem to be encouraging lenders to work constructively with borrowers and uh, there seems to be a relaxed classification in terms of troubled assets uh, during the current time. Now, one thing that you've probably seen uh, in the multifamily arena with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is uh, there is a uh, forbearance with respect to borrowers for 90 days. So long as those borrowers are able to demonstrate a hardship due to COVID-19 and that they're not in evicting tenants uh, due to non-payment during that time frame. Now, again, this is a forbearance of payment. It's not a forgiveness, but it is a, a strong incentive uh, to keep landlords uh, uh, working uh, with tenants. And it will be interesting to see if similar programs or incentives emerge in other uh, real estate sectors. Uh, one thing I did not mention um, in the lease context, but it also applies in the loan um, document context is uh, both lenders and landlords that I have seen have been relatively good about referring uh, struggling debtors with uh, links for the small business loan assistance programs that have been available. Again, Chris will talk about that in a little bit more detail momentarily, but that is one other mechanism to make sure that the parties have explored, uh, uh, even though it seems like the funds have currently uh, dried up in that regard. But some general recommendations with respect to loan workouts that we would recommend is uh, similar to the lease scenario. Communicate early and often with your lender and definitely very carefully document and confirm any modifications or agreements. And for borrowers, um, similar to tenants in the lease circumstance is expect for there to be some concessions. Um, 
lenders, while they want to be cooperate, co while they want to cooperate and have performing loans, uh, are probably going to expect some credit enhancements in connection with either extensions of time or deferrals of payment, and that can take the form of either additional guarantors, additional collateral, and uh, certainly the waiver of certain um, uh, either pro borrower provisions or claims uh, against the lender. So that's most of our summary in terms of loan workouts and things that we are observing uh, and also strategy in terms of, of how, how to properly emerge from the current situation with respect to troubled loans. You can move to the next slide. And um, you can move to the next slide. So I'm not going to say too much on commercial insurance, uh, similar to leases and loans, your obligation to continue to pay for your commercial insurance installments remains. It's just I would definitely implore, particularly any tenant, to talk to their insurance consultant and see what insurance is available um, due to the current situation. You can move to the next slide. Now, how do I get my deal done? We certainly have gotten this question as well. Our general observations have been that deals that were pretty far along, particularly ones that had emerged out of due diligence or concluded due diligence, were able to close during this crisis uh, without too many incidents. Um, in general, um, most courts, at least in Virginia, remained open to handle essential services. Uh, the ability to electronically file certain documents of record certainly helped. Um, now, that's not available in every jurisdiction. Not every jurisdiction has caught up technologically. So it's important that you ask your attorney uh, where electronic filings are available uh, to see if you can continue to uh, uh, navigate the typical conduits to getting your deal closed. And one area where we've gotten more experience lately, and it's good to know about, is the ability to notarize documents remotely. Uh, there are certain companies that are specifically licensed to do remote notarization, and it's a process actually that can take several forms. There's a software application, if you will, that basically has the same legal significance of a traditional uh, notarization seal. Uh, and there are other notaries that can actually observe you executing documents via, via video, video conferencing. Um, much in the same way that they traditionally would. It's just simply through using uh, technology, they're able to see you sign documents. So definitely, uh, if you are ever in the need of those services, uh, reach out to one of the companies that is specifically licensed to do so, and they will help you navigate through the process to make sure it complies uh, with the relevant statute. Uh, we did see some slowdown in terms of title updates due to limited access to record rooms. Uh, however, with online resources and online records, it seems that a lot of those slowdowns have started to catch up and that's becoming less of an issue. And um, with respect to any deals we've had that have stalled out, generally that has been more a function of uh, lenders being skittish and waiting to see uh, what happens in the interim. So we are experiencing some delays in that regard. And uh, unfortunately for some of our clients, um, they are somewhat at the uh, lender's mercy um, until the dust settles in those regards. Um, and we can advance to the next slide. Now, one thing I would suggest with respect to those transactions that are still in the midst of due diligence and you seem to be surrounded by uncertainty, uh, particularly if you're having trouble accessing the premises um, due to the current environment, is suggesting that there be an extension of, and now this isn't a circumstance where force majeure would not otherwise cover the situation, which is probably going to be the, the case in most of your purchase contracts, but maybe having an extension of due diligence, uh, again, having the seller and buyer be cooperative and having due diligence possibly last until 30 days until after the declassification of a state of emergency from really all government authorities uh, with the understanding that it's really not going to exceed a period of say 120 days. That may at least give the parties an assurance that everyone intends for the deal to go forward. They just have to help navigate through this uncertainty. 
So that's one suggestion. It'll be interesting to see if more and more parties utilize uh, mechanisms along those lines. Uh, you can advance to the next slide. I'm not going to mention too much about uh, tax payments and filings. Uh, I think by now most of you all probably realize that federal tax returns and federal income tax uh, payments have been extended until July 15th, 2020 without penalties or interest. And um, that's all that I'm going to mention on deferred tax payments and filings. And with that being said, uh, to the extent Chris has additional comments on the financial assistance to small businesses, I will turn it over to him. Yes, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned up front and as everybody knows, uh, currently there's no more money for any of these programs, uh, but we <clears throat> are operating under the assumption that there will be additional funding. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned, the, the uh, SBA ran out of $350 billion in the first tranche. Uh, the proposal is to add another $250 billion to that. So we'll proceed on the assumption that these loans will uh, again be available. Uh, <clears throat> the important thing to remember is that there are two separate and distinct programs. There is some overlap but they are two separate things. The first one that the government introduced was called the Economic Injury Disaster Loan or an EIDL. Um, that one uh, was exhausted fairly quickly. The next one, and this is really where all the action is, is uh, it was part of the CARES Act, um, which frankly, I forget what that stands for other than coronavirus. Uh, and as an aside, I think what they do up there in Congress is they first think of the acronym and then they think of a law to pass that matches it because um, all of these things have these very clever names. But the program under that as part of the CARES Act was called the Paycheck Protection Program Loans or so-called PPP loans. Uh, those uh, are, are, are far more popular, far more uh, flexible, and so that's what uh, we will spend most of the time on. Uh, next slide, please. So the PPP loans are really an extension of the SBA's uh, existing um, 7A loan program for small businesses. Um, the key uh, here um, is that um, you apply or an interested business applies through a private lender that has previously been approved by the SBA, uh, which um, as I'm sure everybody knows, it stands for the United States Small Business Administration. Uh, it's it's mostly bigger banks that uh, were approved uh, to do these loans. However, uh, I think um, as the program got going, some smaller community banks also uh, got approved. Uh, the the money is is technically fronted by the private bank, but of course no bank would ever make a loan like this without the federal government backing it up. So ultimately, it's federal money and thus taxpayer money that uh, is involved here. Um, this, uh, they call it a PPP loan, but the word loan should be in quotes because uh, as I'll discuss in a minute, a good portion of it can be forgiven with almost no consequence. Um, but technically it is a loan that in theory needs to be repaid. Uh, interestingly, the program is supposed to run until June 30, but it does have a excuse me first come first served feature to it which uh, ran out in less than two weeks so if there's any lesson to be learned uh, if your business is interested in applying for one of these speed is key uh, and really you should go to a bank that you have an existing relationship with uh, that's the best way to get one of these loans uh, next slide please so um, there was some initial confusion about which businesses were eligible for this. Um, the key is that it's any business that meets both of these criteria. They had to have been in business on February 15th of this year, and the business has to have 500 or fewer employees. Um, that date it was selected. Uh, that's when the program went into effect. and. The intent here is to keep existing businesses afloat and not to fund startups. Um, 
there are some nuance nuances to this, uh, which if you have a question about a specific uh, case, uh, feel free to send me an email and I'll be happy to answer it for you. But uh, like like any federal program, there are hundreds of pages of, of the code and regulations that go along with it. Um, and there's uh, it, it's, it's impossible to cover cover every detail in a short presentation like this. Um, one thing about counting the employees uh, that can be tricky is if uh, the business that wants the loan is part of a larger corporate family. Uh, normally, uh, under basic uh, state corporate law, if the proper formalities have been observed, a separate limited liability company or corporation will be deemed a separate legal entity apart from its parent company or its sister corporations. However, uh, the federal government in this case has the ability to disregard those distinctions and aggregate together employees of related businesses. So uh, it really has to be a independent business that has 500 or fewer employees. In certain industries, they, the limit is a little bit higher. Um, importantly, you, you do not need to demonstrate any particular financial hardship directly caused by COVID-19. Uh, basically, there's a, a self-certification process uh, where the applicant has to certify that the funds are going to be used for payroll and, and certain other permitted expenses and that they need the loan. But uh, there's not too much uh, investigation or underwriting done on that question. Uh, next slide, please. So the loan terms, uh, the, the maximum amount that any uh, borrower can receive is two and a half times the average monthly payroll costs uh, up to a maximum loan of $10 million. <clears throat> the average monthly payroll costs, there are pages and pages of regulations, <clears throat> excuse me, on how that is done. The general rule is you average the trailing, trailing 12 months of, <clears throat> excuse me, of payroll costs before the loan uh, was applied for. You have to exclude compensation for any individual over 100,000. <clears> that doesn't mean you have to exclude the, that person's compensation entirely from your payroll cost calculation. You just need to exclude the portion that is over 100,000. Uh, and there's details on how you include benefits and other elements of compensation in the payroll costs that are eligible for funding. Um, importantly, you can only use the loan proceeds for a handful of things, but um, they are usually your <laughs> biggest expense. Payroll and important for this group, rent. Um, you can also use it for utilities, for the uh, business facility, and interestingly, you can also use it to pay interest on other business debt. Next slide, please. And again, we use the word loan in quotes because among, in addition to the forgiveness that I'll talk about in a minute, there are no personal guarantees, there's no collateral. Um, the only restriction really is if you have already received an idle loan um, or funding from another source to, to pay payroll or rent, you cannot use, uh, you cannot get, then get PPP uh, funding for that same purpose. Next slide, please. So here's, um, here's where all the action is. Uh, most of the loan can be forgiven if a couple of uh, conditions are met. Most importantly, at least 75% of it has to be used for payroll costs. So while you can use 100% of it to pay rent if you want, you will not be able to have any of that loan forgiven. So as a practical matter, most businesses are only going to use 25% of the loan proceeds for rent. Uh, the way uh, the SBA determines how much is going to be forgiven is you have to do a ratio that is generally your number of employees that you keep during the eight week period after getting the loan as compared to other measurement periods. Um, importantly, it's 
FTE or full-time equivalent employees, um, which means you add up the hours that folks work and divide it by your standard work week to determine one full-time equivalent. So if your payroll is based on a 35-hour work week and you have one employee who works 20 hours a week and one that works 15, that is one FTE. So you do that calculation for the eight week period following when you get the loan and you divide it by that same FTE calculation for the period. Either you can choose February 15th of this year through June 30, or you can choose January 1 of this year through the end of February. So basically that metric is used to, to determine how much of your payroll you kept um, after getting the loan. And as the name implies, Paycheck Protection Program, that's the entire purpose of it, or the, the, the primary purpose of it. Um, you can also get dinged if you reduce wages of people making less than 100,000 by more than 25%. Um, you have to exclude from the amount forgiven the amount of wages above 25%. Um, that are uh, reduced. Next slide, please. So, uh, as you can tell by the speed with which we, they uh, <laughs> originated all these loans, um, there is not a whole lot of documentation. Um, you do, as a business uh, owner, have to certify the expenses uh, and your payroll count, and they will ask for receipts and. Uh, for rent and, and there is some documentation required, um, but you do not need to have your books independently audited or anything like that. For the amounts that are not forgiven, it's converted converted to a term loan um, that can be up to 10 years and the rate uh, is, a, is a maximum of 4%. I should mention that um, the, the, the nominal rate for these loans is 1%. Um, but as I said, most is going to be forgiven and the portion that isn't is going to be subject to these terms. Um, and then uh, critically, uh, the bottom there, the forgiveness is not counted as cancellation of debt income in a normal environment. Uh, if your business is, if you borrow $10 million and then the lender says you don't have to pay it back, you have to report that as $10 million of income. Um, that uh, rule does not apply to this forgiveness. Um, and then also, um, to the extent you have to re repay it, uh, they're deferred for six months. Um, so it's really, a, 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 obviously, it's, it's free money, as you um, probably have heard people refer to it as. Um, and then uh, one point that's not on the slide here, but most of the uh, loan officers that I've talked to and, and the roundtables that I've participated in uh, have indicated that banks are treating these more like equity than debt for those companies that have existing lines of credit or loans. So in the normal rule is in almost every case, if a business has a working capital line and or term loans, uh, those loan documents will prohibit the business from getting additional debt uh, or putting additional encumbrances on the assets without the current lender's consent. Um, because of the uh, uh, unusual time that we're in and uh, really just, you, you know, to use that old phrase, uncharted waters, banks are basically saying, well, you know, this is this is like equity because this money's probably not going to be paid back or a good good chunk of it is not. Um, next slide, please. So that was the PPP loan, the Paycheck Protection Program loan. Uh, the SBA also offered the IDLES Economic Injury Disaster Loans. Um, really, uh, if they bring the PPP loans back, there, there isn't any reason to try to get one of these. Uh, because it's uh, it's more um, bureaucracy. There's 
eligibility is more restricted. For example, uh, real estate companies, for the most part, are not eligible. Uh, the maximum loan amount is $2 million. Uh, it's not a straight up formula like it is with the PPP loan. It's the SBA has to determine the company's financial need. They evaluate credit history. Um, and these are, these are loans that a business applies for directly with the SBA. You don't go through a private bank. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, it, it, sort of more like a traditional loan, technically collateral is required for any loan over 25,000, but required is in quotes because there are a number of exceptions to that. And there is no forgiveness. Um, it does have to be repaid, although you get 30 years to do it. The interest rate is very favorable, 3.75 for businesses, 2.75 for nonprofits. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if this program is also going to come back. Um, mostly what I've seen is that Congress is just trying to find additional funding for the PPP program. Uh, so that's the basics uh, on, on these two programs, uh, just sort of on a bigger picture, more philosophical note. Um, you know, someone who made it beyond Econ 202 is going to have to tell me what the consequences of this will be. But just sort of thinking back, the, uh, the government has printed $2.2 trillion in just a few weeks. Um, our current national debt load is about $22 trillion. Uh, this $2.2 trillion is more than 10% of our nation's GDP, and actually that figure is probably going to be higher. So, um, you know, I'm no expert, but I'm guessing we're going to see some inflation and increased interest rates among a number of other consequences from this. But it had to be done because the alternative would have been much worse. Um, so that's all we have, um, and I'll send it back to Richard. Sorry, Richard, you're going to have to unmute. Thank you so much for that. And yes, I'm going to go ahead and publish some of the questions that we've received. Um, looks like we have kind of a two thirds, one third split on uh, leasing questions versus uh, some of the, the pay, Paycheck Protection Program and some of the SBA loan assistance. So I will go ahead and um, let me just scroll up and publish the first question we had that pertained to force majeure. And the question is uh, from the tenant's perspective, how important will it be to negotiate force majeure going forward? I think um, we're definitely going to have, <laughs> it's going to be very clear that the force majeure clause is no longer going to be deemed to be the trivial boilerplate that tends to get ignored during lease negotiations. I would not be at all surprised to see the words contagion, pandemic, epidemic all appear as specific events under the force majeure clause. I, in fact, I would not be surprised to see including without limitation COVID-19 and some even more specific um, uh, diseases and viruses uh, going forward. So I think also people will be more reluctant to assume that the catch-all terminology such as events beyond the control of the parties and um, and acts of God is going to be sufficient. I think they realize that it's you're really going to have to have that express language going forward. Um, one other question we got related to leases uh, pertains to um, holdover, and I'll, I'll read the question, then I'll publish it for you, is how, how, how might force majeure apply to a holdover scenario, and specifically where a tenant has plans to relocate, but the space can't be delivered on time due to a delay in the relocation of the tenant um, in the suite that tenant A has leased. I think in situations like that, I'll go ahead and publish the question, you're definitely going to have to examine uh, in that specific lease as to whether holdover is as a matter of right. I think in most 
uh, leases. You do have a provision like that that oftentimes is intended to capture the situation where the tenants remained in the space, not necessarily because they're allowed to, but it addresses what they have to pay if basically the landlord hasn't terminated the lease or terminated their right to possession to remove them. Um, so I think in those scenarios, I do think it's going to be another scenario where cooperation and understanding is going to have to be the key because I do think landlords are going to have the upper hand if they so choose to exercise it and the penalty rate, whether it's 150 percent or 200 percent that you typically see in scenarios like that, I think the landlord is going to be able to collect that because uh, there's really not going to be language in the lease that contemplates either a commensurate extension for that tenant or any sort of relief that they pay their standard rate uh, or their most current rate uh, that existed under the lease. I think, frankly, if the landlord wants to play hardball in a situation like that, I think the tenant is going to be stuck paying that 150 percent or 200 percent um, rate. Uh, Chris or Jay, did you have any additional thoughts on that? Uh yeah, Richard, this is Chris. I don't think so. It's uh, I, I was on another uh, panel talking about uh, commercial real estate issues, and it, it sort of became apparent that this uh, COVID situation and the, af the aftermath from it, the effects from it, is so widespread and so unprecedented that really uh, the normal kind of legal uh, rules and legal principles and procedures um, are not the entire answer. Um, normally, if someone is, uh, uh, if, if there's disagreement over what a contract means and the parties cannot work it out, you go to court and the court tells you, well, all the courts are uh, closed to some extent. They're not completely closed, but for practical purposes, if you have a civil dispute, like for example, under a commercial lease, it's going to be a while before you get any sort of hearing on that. So uh, really, it's it's about a practical negotiation and it's about, uh, you know, folks uh, trying to work it out. Um, you know, it's it's uh, and, and and getting creative. Uh, with uh, you know what what does the landlord have to offer? What does the tenant have to offer? And you know n neither of us are served by both of us just standing still. Okay. Uh, the next question uh, is how does the impact of a guarantor on a lease or a loan come into play in this situation? Uh, I would say in either context, whether it's a lease workout or a loan workout, most guarantors are going to be on the hook. Now, there are nuances to that. Um, if you have CMBS debt, you may have a carve out guarantee situation. But if we're talking about a traditional guarantee, um, if the te if the tenant is in a bad situation with respect to a lease guarantee or the borrower is in a bad situation with respect to the traditional loan documents, a guarantor is on the hook for virtually all those obligations. Um, the only exception to that would be if there was a limited guarantee that basically said only in this, you know, the following circumstances will the guarantee be invoked with respect to a personal guarantor. Um, for the most part, that guarantor is going to step into the shoes of the tenant uh, or the borrower with respect to their respective obligations. So I, I think that largely answers that question. I'll go ahead and publish that so people can see that. Uh, the next question. Uh, this pertained to my uh, the suggestion I had in terms of extending due diligence through an amendment and just the cooperation with the parties. And it was basically saying if if the property conditions haven't changed, um, you know, what's what's the main purpose of a 120 day extension? And one thing I didn't clarify, um, it's less of an issue during due diligence if you've already received certain third party reports um, which don't necessarily necessitate physical access to the premises. Uh, for example, in some of the transactions that we've worked on recently, we were fortunate that those third party reports for title survey and zoning uh, we already had and we could review and we could turn out our title objection letters with no problem. Uh, it has become a problem on some of the multifamily deals that we've been working on. 
where the physical premises has to be accessed for purposes of assessing property condition and so on. And it's still during the course of due diligence. And so more time is in fact needed to actually gain that access to do a full and complete review. So those are more the scenarios where the true physical inspection is required and has not yet been completed. So 120 days, don't know if it would need that much time, but it, that's something that, that definitely is up to the parties um, uh, to determine between themselves in terms of how much time is needed uh, to complete that. And then Chris, I'm gonna skip to, I think the very last question, just cause it dovetails with both of ours, and then I'll let you um, pick up with some of the SBA loan questions. Uh, and actually it looks like we have a bankruptcy question here as well. Uh, we have one question that this is related a little bit to the rent reductions as well as the SBA uh, loan assistance. And the question is, uh, does getting those loans and having to provide proof um, is uh, with respect to the landlord's position, uh, is it is it reasonable to request those? And um, in general, I, I, I don't think um, disputing it would be uh, too favorable. I think it is one of those things that gives landlords an accurate picture as to um, the total equities of the situation and truly the level of need that that tenant has, because if they have gotten, if they were fortunate enough to have gotten their application in in a timely manner and gotten some of the um, support for their payroll expenses during that time frame, that does shape the degree to which the landlord is willing to grant some deferral or abatement uh, with respect to a lease lease workout. Uh, Chris or Jay, did you have any additional questions? I'll go ahead and publish that question as well, and then I'll turn it over to Chris for some of these other SBA associated uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, this is Chris, um, and thank you, uh, Brian, uh, Deborah, and and Keith uh, for submitting your questions. We really appreciate that. Uh, the in, in, for the question about um, uh, for for Brian's question about uh, requiring tenants to uh, provide proof of what they use the money for, there there are two angles to that. The first is with that tenant's uh, interaction with the bank and the SBA. Uh, they will have to provide some documentation that they use the funds for a proper purpose. The second angle is the relationship between the landlord and the tenant, uh, which is completely outside of the SBA's uh, purview or the statute or any of the rules that go with it. That is purely a contract negotiation. So uh, the tenant will, will is approaching the landlord to ask to modify the contract. The landlord can impose uh, the landlord being under no obligation to reduce the rent, uh, modify the contract to reduce the rent, can ask for whatever documentation it wants. Um, that's the legal answer. Uh, the practical answer is, again, uh, if the tenant says, you know, I just I I'm not going to pay. I can't pay my rent in the full amount. Uh, and so next month I'm sending you a check for half of it. Um, the landlord's recourse uh, is, uh, you know, what would uh, to follow the steps under the lease, whether that includes lockout or if you have to go to court, uh, it's going to be a while. So the the answer is, if the tenant wants to reduce the rent, it's reasonable for the landlord to to provide to have the tenant provide some documentation. Uh, you know, financial statements plus uh, uh, evidence of, of the loan funding and uh, how the money was used. Maybe a modified P&L or income statement would show that. Hey, Chris, Jay Rixey here. I'm just going to add one thing. Um, one thing that I saw last week that we dealt with, we had a tenant who asked for a um, three month waiver on the rent. And as a condition to that, the landlord basically required two things. He agreed to allow the three month waiver on rent provided the tenant sign a three month extension on the end. And it was also a condition of that extension that if the tenant successfully got a PPP loan, the tenant was required to use the portion of the PPP loan that it could use to pay rent 
to pay rent. That was a condition of that extension. So that kind of you know goes along in that same scenario. Thank you, Jay. Uh, and then we did get two uh, questions uh, about the PPP loan program. I just uh, published them. Um, uh, the question is, can you still apply for a regular SBA loan? Uh, the answer is yes. The practical answer is the chances of you actually getting the attention of an SBA representative are probably less than zero at this point if you're not involved in one of these emergency uh, programs. I don't know that for a fact. That is just my guess. Then the second question uh, from Louisa about if you if you were already in the pipeline, um, will you get first consideration if they resume funding? Uh, unfortunately, I do not know the answer to that. Um, your best bet is to talk to your banker uh, that you filed the application with. And I believe we have one final question um, concerning bankruptcy, which I will uh, send over to our colleague Jed Donaldson, um, who is the bankruptcy attorney. And uh, Jed, uh, can you see that that question there? Yes, thank you, Chris. And it's good to be with everyone this morning. As you'll see, the question is how long does a debtor have after filing a Chapter 11 to decide whether or not to accept or reject a lease? The answer relevant to real estate leases, it's different for non-real property leases, but for real estate leases, the statute affords a debtor 120 days from the date of the petition. And that 120 day period may be extended, but with court authorization for 90 days um, on the debtor's motion. And the standard there is cause, which is always fun and a little bit amorphous. But the short of it is, is 120 and then a potential extra 90 days there. But thank you for that. Now, I'll turn it back over, Richard, if you want to close. Um, yes, thank, thank you, Jed, and, and thank you, Jay and Chris, for your contributions, and thank you for those that have submitted questions. So in slightly more than an hour, we've covered the impact of COVID-19 on commercial real estate, and of course, this is only one small part of the various ways that this crisis is affecting us and the world. Uh, there are various other aspects, government contracts and labor and employment and technology and numerous other issues. And fortunately, our firm has a very wide breadth of practice areas to assist you in those areas, as well as numerous webinars just like this one. Uh, so definitely visit our website if you want to learn more about COVID-19 and the legal issues surrounding that and people and attorneys in our firm will be more than glad to help you in those regards. So thank you again for joining us today and uh, good luck, stay healthy in this crisis. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing many of you on the other side of it. And until next time, take care, stay healthy, and we will sign off at this point. Thank you so much. <laughs>